It is embarrassing to say, but Emily has no father, is poor, and uneducated, such an incompetent person. But our family will properly educate her. At my and my husband Mike's wedding reception, my mother-in-law Megan took the stage under the guise of giving a speech and said this into the microphone. She smeared on a thick layer of lipstick, curling her lips into an unpleasant smile. Our family runs a business. A woman raised in a single-parent household? Who knows what kind of disorderly life she led? We can't have someone of such low quality as our daughter-in-law tarnishing our name. Her spiteful words, so out of place at such a joyous occasion, caused the room to buzz with unease. Fear of my precious wedding being ruined turned my body cold. My father had passed away when I was very young, and I had grown up supporting my mother Amanda as an only child. She had worked tirelessly day and night to put me through high school, and now I was a respectable working adult. There was nothing to be ashamed of, and anger surged from the pit of my stomach at the way she spoke. Moreover, she shouldn't have known about my family background. I felt a great fear at not knowing where this information had leaked from. No way! This is awful! Why? Overwhelmed by various shocks, I couldn't hold back my tears at what should have been a celebratory event. Sitting beside me, Mike was pale and frozen. Megan had been obsessed with Mike and had tried to interfere with our relationship, which had exasperated him. He had spoken to her directly many times before. But he probably never imagined she would drop such a bombshell at our wedding. The atmosphere of the venue, which had been illuminated by a luxurious chandelier and decorated with vibrant flowers, now seemed severely tainted. At that moment, loud footsteps echoed. Looking up, I saw my mother heading towards the stage. Usually gentle and calm, she now wore an expression hardened by quiet anger. She ascended the stage, glaring at Megan. Then, she forcibly took the microphone from Megan's hand. Megan, who was still processing the situation, looked shocked as my mother spoke into the microphone in a low voice. The one of poor quality is your company. That company, we have decided to put out of business. My name is Emily. I am a 31-year-old office worker. Mike, three years my junior, and I met at the same company. I was drawn to Mike's honest and gentle nature, and he said he was attracted to my hard-working attitude. His parents run a natural foods import and sales business, making Mike the son of a company president. It was said that Mike's parents sent him to work at a company other than their own to gain social experience. The company I work for is run by my mother and also deals in health and natural foods. In other words, they are competitors in the same industry. My father passed away when I was young, and my mother now runs the company as its president. I work as a systems engineer at this company and began working closely with Mike teaching him about app development. Unaware of his own good looks, he was secretly popular within the company. However, he had little experience with relationships and was awkward, making an effort to find topics of conversation whenever we went for lunch. His efforts were endearing, and one day, with great determination, he said, Um, if you aren't seeing anyone right now, would you consider dating me? His earnest confession was charming, and I was touched by Mike's sincerity. I, too, had little experience with relationships, being focused on my career, and it was the first time anyone had confessed to me so straightforwardly. Despite my initial confusion, my affection for him outweighed it, and I agreed to date him. He was popular among the female employees, so we decided to keep our relationship a secret at work. Thus began our quiet and fresh relationship, but soon dark clouds loomed over our days. During dates with him, his smartphone would ring frequently. Each time, he would step away to take the call and then return. Given his position, it seemed unlikely he was getting continuous work calls, and I couldn't imagine he was cheating with another woman. 
Feeling suspicious, I asked. You keep taking calls. Is everything okay? Is something wrong? Mike looked a bit uncomfortable but answered. From his demeanor, I could tell he wasn't lying. It's my mom. She wants me to update her on everything we're doing together. What? Seriously? Mike's mother's control and his apparent lack of resentment towards it surprised me. I couldn't help but raise my voice in shock. While I didn't know how he was talking to her, there was nothing I needed to hide. Still, our time together was private, and it didn't feel good to have everything reported to his mother. Although it was hard to interfere with another family's rules, I knew I had to address it if I was going to marry Mike someday. Cautiously, I said, that might be a bit of a problem. It's hard to relax with frequent calls, and I don't like having every detail of our time together shared. Doesn't it bother you? That might be a bit of a problem. It's hard to relax with frequent calls, and I don't like having every detail of our time together shared. Doesn't it bother you? He looked at me with a troubled expression. Is it really that strange? It seemed he had hardly ever talked about relationships with friends his age. He was puzzled that I disliked something he had taken for granted. Yes, it is. Sorry, but could you avoid taking calls while we're together? If you must talk to your mom, could you do it after we part? Not take calls! Mike repeated slowly, as if hearing the words for the first time, and his eyes widened in surprise. I wondered what kind of life he had led and what sort of relationship he had with his parents. The thought made me slightly anxious about our future. Yes. Everyone misses calls when they're busy and can call back later. Oh. That makes sense. That way, I can focus on our date. He nodded deeply, his eyes sparkling. It was as if he had just learned, for the first time in his life, that he didn't have to answer his mother's calls. I'm nervous, but thank you for telling me. Although it seemed obvious to me, he was excited and kept thanking me repeatedly. Blushing, he turned off his smartphone. After that, there were no more calls interrupting our time together. We spent a lot of time talking, undisturbed by anyone. And for the next few weeks, Mike made it a point to turn off his smartphone while with me. It's really nice not having the phone ring, he said with amazement. Is this what being the son of a company president is like? I wondered. Despite some concerns, I continued our relationship, as Mike was genuinely honest and sincere. Yes. Let's keep our time together just for us. I smiled, and he nodded. But around this time, something strange started happening. One day, while walking with Mike in town, I constantly felt someone watching us. No matter where we went, the same footsteps followed. I was certain we were being tailed. Hey, is someone following us? I asked Mike, who then stiffened. This is creepy. Let me handle it. I told him and then turned around at the next corner to confront whoever was following us. Then, the person who had been following us appeared easily. It was a middle-aged woman carrying a bag with a prominent brand logo. Her heavy makeup and sunglasses suggested she was trying to hide her identity. Excuse me. You've been following us, haven't you? I confronted her. She twisted her lips painted in bright red lipstick, into a sneer. So, you're Emily? You're quite plain, aren't you? Hearing this insult from a stranger made me instantly angry, and then Mike turned around at the sound of the voice. In that moment, he exclaimed in surprise. Mom! What are you doing here? Why are you following us? What? Your mom! It was my turn to be shocked. The heavily made-up woman in front of me was Mike's mother, Megan. The woman Mike called his mother took off her sunglasses, revealing her face, and smiled nastily. 
Mike, you haven't been answering my calls on your days off lately. You used to update me on your dates. So I followed you because I was worried. What has that woman been teaching you? Her obsession with her son was so strong that she resorted to stalking him. And her harsh words directed at me were unbelievable, especially coming from someone I had just met. I felt my blood rush to my head and stepped forward to confront her. Following us secretly is inappropriate. Weekends are private time, even for family. There's nothing suspicious about us, so please stop. She looked surprised and then put on a deliberately troubled expression. How rude. I'm his mother. What's wrong with a parent worrying about their child? He's my precious only son, and I can't have him dating an unsuitable woman. I didn't back down and tried to reason with Megan. Don't you trust Mike? That's not caring, it's just controlling. I work in the same company as him and live a serious life. If you understand, please stop following us. Perhaps taken aback by my outburst, Megan pouted like a child and left while mumbling something. Watching her walk away with slumped shoulders was somewhat pathetic, but spying on our dates was going too far. As the tension released, I let out a big sigh. Mike, standing beside me, grabbed my shoulder and looked at me with shining eyes. Thank you. It's amazing that you stood up to my mom. It's nothing. I just said what was necessary. I'm glad she left. But her obsession is a bit much. As I looked down, Mike hunched his shoulders too. Yes. My mom has the strongest influence in our family. She can't stand not knowing everything about us, and we've always just accepted that. I knew Mike was the son of a rival company's president. Megan might be the type who needs to control both the company and the family. That night, Mike thanked me repeatedly for confronting his mother and then proposed to me. I've always been frustrated with my mom. She knows everything about my private life, and I thought that was normal. But you made me realize I didn't like it. Thank you. With your intelligence and strength, I feel like my life can be freer. His sunny smile lifted my spirits as well. I'm not as remarkable as Mike thinks. But if marrying Mike leads to happiness, I want to build a future with him. Yet, I still had concerns. Thank you. I want to spend my life with you too. But I'm worried about your mother. Marriage involves both families, and I'm not sure how well I'll get along with your family. Mike took my hand and made a promise. I'm sorry to worry you. My mom is strong-willed, and she might be overbearing in the future. But no matter what, I'll always be on your side. His clear promise reassured me, and I nodded. When you have concerns about your future mother-in-law, the biggest worry is that your husband will side with her. But if Mike promised to support me, I felt I could handle it. Okay. Thank you. Let's take care of each other from now on. And so, we officially became engaged. The first thing we did was inform my mother. The day before, Mike had stopped by his parents' house for some reason, but it didn't affect our visit to my family. We took the bus to my parents' house, which wasn't far away, and my mother warmly welcomed Mike. Emily has always worried me. She's been working so hard, and I was a bit concerned. But meeting you has been wonderful. From now on, live for your own happiness. My mother, looking apologetic, blessed us with a big smile. I had told her in advance that Mike was the son of another company's president, but it didn't seem to be an issue at all. Following this, I told Mike about being raised in a single-parent household, and how my father had died in a traffic accident at work when I was young. Family background can significantly impact marriage. The thought of Mike breaking off our engagement upon learning this made me tremble as I waited for his response. 
He listened to my story with a sad expression throughout and then supported my back. You've been through so much and worked so hard. From now on, I'll be here for you. Let's be happy together. His words brought tears of relief. Mike wiped away my tears, and my mother watched us warmly. With him, I felt I could spend my future in peace. Thus, our visit to my family ended. And later, the day came to visit Mike's parents. Yes, the house with his mother, Megan. As expected, Megan remained in a bad mood the entire time. Even at home, she wore heavy makeup and a sweater with a large brand logo. I need to get back to work as soon as this is over. So let's keep it short. She said coldly, placing the coffee roughly on the table. Sure, a president's work is busy. But there are better ways to say that. At the very least, my mother, also a president, never treats guests rudely, whether at work or at home. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. I apologized superficially. Unlike your laid-back company, we're constantly working to expand our business. We cut costs to the bone, increase sales, and take on new ventures. I'm the one managing and controlling everything. Of course, Megan knew my mother was the president of a rival company. That's why she made such sarcastic remarks. Megan's business acumen might be impressive, but that doesn't mean we're slacking off. Our company's policy is to build trust steadily by valuing employees and customers. Mike's father, Joseph, was also present but only smiled wryly and sipped his coffee. Apparently, as Mike said, no one else had a say in Megan's presence. Well, let's put work aside. This is a happy occasion, Joseph managed to say with difficulty. Megan glanced at him briefly and then started attacking me again as if she hadn't heard him. So, Mike is our only son. Are you planning to support our future president? Or are you going to stay at your company for the rest of your life? Megan sat on an armchair opposite me, looking down at me from her grand position. That's right. For now, I'll continue working at my current company, but I do want to support Mike. I expect there will be times when I need to focus on pregnancy and childbirth, so can we discuss my career later? I made this request. It's understandable that having their son's wife working for a rival company wouldn't sit well. However, I still had a strong desire to work hard at my mother's company. At the same time, it's true that my career plans after pregnancy and childbirth were uncertain. Considering various factors, I asked to leave it undecided for now. Megan laughed derisively at me and lit a cigarette on the spot. Fine, do as you please for now. Just don't tarnish our company's name. Then, Mike, who was sitting next to me, leaned forward. Mom, don't worry. Once I finish my current job, I'll definitely return to your company and contribute. Emily is very diligent and hardworking, so she'll manage both work and family well. We'll support each other and be happy. Please, take care of us." Megan remained silent and sullen for a while before she reluctantly said. Fine. Mike, remember your duty as our successor and do it well. With those words, Megan ended the conversation. I didn't bring up the fact that I was raised by a single mother at this meeting. Mike had told me beforehand that family backgrounds shouldn't affect our marriage. Probably, he anticipated that Megan wouldn't remain quiet if she knew. I appreciated his consideration and focused on discussing our commitment to marriage and the future, convincing Megan. After Megan fell silent, Joseph shifted the conversation to the specifics of the wedding. We need to decide on the wedding date. We'll suggest locations and a guest list so you can handle the details. I struggled to keep from making a displeased face. In truth, I didn't want a big wedding. I didn't have many acquaintances to invite, and more interaction with Megan would be required if we held a large event. 
If possible, I wanted to keep my distance from Megan. Whether he understood my feelings or not, Mike spoke to Joseph. Do we really need a big reception? It's a lot of work, and I'd be fine with just family. At that moment, Megan raised her voice. What are you talking about? Not having a proper reception would be disgraceful for the son of a company president. You need to publicly celebrate your marriage with all our employees and business partners. It's ridiculous that you don't understand this. I'm really worried now. Her voice grew more intense. To calm her down, I responded firmly. Understood. We'll have a reception. We'll make sure it properly highlights your company. Though I wasn't enthusiastic, I couldn't risk upsetting Megan further. I suppressed my true feelings and showed enthusiasm for the reception. Mike, are you okay with this? Yes, but are you sure? Yes. We have people we want to invite too, and if we can handle the details, let's do it. Thus, the discussion about the wedding at Mike's parents' house ended. I still had concerns about how things would go with them, especially Megan, but I hoped to manage somehow. I've handled tough meetings at work many times, so accommodating others' wishes and finding common ground is something I'm good at. I want to handle both work and family smoothly. A few weeks later, we received potential venues and hurriedly prepared for the wedding. Mike's side planned to invite many employees and acquaintances, so I hastily consulted my mother and increased our guest list. There were a few minor disputes, like the order of speeches with Megan, but nothing escalated into a major issue, and the wedding day approached. A few months later, the wedding day arrived. I arrived at the venue hours before the ceremony, changed into my dress in the waiting room, and had my makeup and hair done. Looking at myself in the mirror, I couldn't help but smile, thinking I didn't look bad. Although most of the wedding details were decided by Mike's family, I insisted on wearing a dress of my own choosing, and I went to the final fitting alone. The flowing mermaid line dress beautifully accentuated my figure, and I couldn't wait for my mother, friends, and Mike to see it. As I was enjoying my happy feelings, she suddenly burst into the waiting room. She entered without knocking, with force. Her face was twisted in anger. Emily, you changed the dress I picked out, didn't you? She immediately blamed me. I chose a cute one for you, but you changed it to something mature. What were you thinking? Being criticized for my beautiful dress made me feel uncomfortable. However, I was calm at that moment, so I managed to smile. Sorry. Mike said this one suits me better. I wasn't lying. When I decided to change the dress design, I consulted Mike and got his approval. He also told me this one suited me better. Megan looked annoyed and said, I see. Just don't make any more unnecessary changes and don't embarrass us during the ceremony. Then left, slamming the door. Relieved that it didn't escalate further, I sighed in relief. The wedding should be for the bride and groom. Yet, the venue, the details, everything was decided by Mike's family, and now my dress choice was being criticized. It felt so stifling. Still, it's my wedding day. I can't have the bride looking gloomy. I looked at myself in the mirror again to lift my spirits, then headed to the venue. The spacious venue was filling up with guests. Relatives, colleagues, superiors, subordinates, business partners, friends, the number kept increasing, eventually exceeding 100 people. Of course, Megan, Joseph, and my mother were there. Despite the nerves, the ceremony proceeded smoothly. We entered arm in arm, and the host gave a flattering speech, picking out only the best parts of our backgrounds. Slides of our memories played, and we cut the wedding cake. Naturally, Mike was moved by my wedding dress and told me I was the most beautiful woman in the world. During the reception, friends congratulated us and took many photos. 
everyone praised my carefully chosen dress, which made me truly happy. Then, towards the end of the ceremony, it was time for the family speeches. The first speech was to be given by Megan, representing the groom's family. Megan, in her heavy makeup and high-end brand suit, looked more like a ghost than anything else. Standing on the stage, Megan delivered the usual congratulatory phrases for our marriage. Receiving applause from over 100 guests, Megan looked satisfied. Then Megan paused, took a breath, and with her lips smeared in bright red lipstick, she gave a nasty smile. The next words Megan spoke took my breath away. Embarrassingly, Emily is fatherless, poor, uneducated, and such an incompetent, dirty woman, but our family will properly educate her. Her voice, amplified by the microphone, filled the large venue. Our family runs a company. Who knows what kind of disordered life a woman raised in a single-parent household led. We can't have someone of such low quality as our daughter-in-law tarnishing our name. Her loud words were directed at me, her eyes terrifyingly narrowed. I felt a chill of fear run down my spine. The luxurious chandeliers hanging from the ceiling and the various flowers densely decorating the venue. The festive and glamorous atmosphere suddenly lost its color. Megan's spiteful words caused a buzz of unease in the audience. Why? My body turned cold as my precious wedding was being ruined. My mother and I had supported each other and worked hard to get here. She had sent me to high school, and I had studied programming at a vocational school afterward, becoming skilled enough to be entrusted with app development at work and eventually taking on leadership responsibilities. My mother ran her company while raising me, always calm and well-respected. There was nothing shameful about us. The derogatory remarks made me furious from the bottom of my heart. How did she know about my family? I hadn't told her. The fear of not knowing where the information had leaked from gripped me. This can't be true, it's awful. Overwhelmed by various shocks, I lowered my head and tears fell at what should have been a joyous occasion. Sitting beside me, Mike was also pale and frozen. He hadn't expected such a bombshell to be dropped at our wedding either. How can I restore the atmosphere? I need to think, but my mind isn't working. Seconds felt like an eternity to me. Then, I heard the loud sound of footsteps. Looking up, I saw my mother walking towards the stage. Her usually gentle and calm demeanor was replaced by a hard expression of quiet anger. She climbed the stage, glaring at Megan. Then, she forcibly took the microphone from Megan. Megan, still processing the situation, looked shocked as my mother spoke into the microphone in a low voice. The one of poor quality is your company. Our company has decided to put yours out of business. Those words caused the already buzzing venue to become even more chaotic. My mother continued speaking with a dignified presence. As mentioned earlier in the introductions, Emily works at a company I run. Our company's restructuring efforts have left your company with no strength to continue. As she spoke, Megan glanced at Mike. Looking a bit uncomfortable, he took the microphone from my mother. Uh, we didn't expect to discuss this at the wedding, but our company's policy of cutting costs to the bone and increasing profits led to excessive employee workloads. The atmosphere in the venue shifted again. The groom's company affiliates looked down, and my friends were surprised. I repeatedly asked my mother to improve the working conditions that violated the law, but she wouldn't listen, saying it was necessary to expand the company. When I consulted Emily, her mother had just started a business reform, so she headhunted almost all of our company's employees. And they all agreed. Megan's face turned pale, not from makeup but from shock. Her face twisted with surprise and humiliation, making her look even more monstrous. That's a lie! It can't be true! All employees resigning is impossible! 
I, the president, would know if it were true, so it must be a lie. My mother responded firmly to her. You, as the president, haven't properly kept track of your employees. We've already secured the approval of your HR manager, who will also be joining us. Despite overworking her employees day and night, Megan hadn't bothered to learn their faces or names, and she had long since lost their trust, even from her HR manager. Everything had been arranged without her knowledge. Trembling, Megan screamed in a high-pitched voice. Stop saying ridiculous things. I get it. You're embarrassed and bitter because you don't have a husband. That's why you're insulting me at this important occasion. My mother, looking exasperated, calmly said to Megan, That's not true. You are the one who tried to ruin this ceremony first. That's not true. I was just trying to properly educate this girl, who grew up in a fatherless household, unrefined and unintelligent, with no proper upbringing, to be a suitable future wife for the president. At that point, Joseph approached. Standing between Megan and my mother, he tried to calm the situation. Now, now, both of you, let's stop this. This is a joyous occasion. We can discuss company matters later. What Joseph said was reasonable, and both Megan and my mother fell silent with sullen expressions. As they started to return to their seats, a man suddenly appeared near the stage. We are also responsible for not addressing the illegal labor practices sooner. But Megan and Joseph, no one can excuse your embezzlement. It was Nicholas, an executive at Megan's company, who spoke in a low voice. He was the person handling HR mentioned earlier. Joseph looked shocked and glared at Nicholas with a face twisted like a demon. Megan ground her teeth with a terrifying expression. The accounting department reported every month that the company's books didn't match. Even though sales were up and costs were down, the profits didn't add up. The president always skipped meetings for business trips, so you might not have known. Last month, we discovered on security cameras that you were taking company funds. This caused the audience's murmurs to reach a peak. Embezzlement? I can't believe it. Such voices were clearly audible from various places. My mother had also heard about the embezzlement while headhunting Megan's company's employees. She hadn't intended to bring it up here, but she had informed each employee individually. She shouted with a red face. Stop saying nonsense. Do you have any idea how hard I work to increase the company's profits? Enough already. Her shrill scream was the last straw, and the reception was ultimately cancelled. My in-laws fled to the waiting room. The host hurriedly announced the cancellation, and the guests left disappointed. I could only apologize to a few friends and promise to see them again. Then, Mike, my mother, and I went to the waiting room where my in-laws were hiding. The door wasn't locked, so we opened it and immediately saw their devastated faces. Mike was the first to speak. Mom. It was supposed to be a wonderful reception. I'm really disappointed. It was your idea to have this reception in the first place. Despite his words, they said nothing. I approached them and looked them in the eyes as I asked. I didn't tell you about my family, especially that my father is not around. How did you find out? She glared up at me and confessed the reason. The day before Mike went to report to Emily's family, I called him to her house. That's what I put a bug in his bag. What? No way! Mike exclaimed in surprise. Thinking back, her behavior had been suspicious since she followed us. This person would do anything, including planting a bug, to control her son. We should have been more cautious when she called Mike to her house before the greeting day. Mike, I'm sorry. I should have been more careful. 
that's not it. Mike firmly stopped me as I tried to speak. Emily did nothing wrong. It was I who should have been more cautious then. Despite the situation, I felt tears welling up from the joy of Mike defending me. And those tears turned into tears of fear. Megan's relentless obsession with Mike. The stalking during our dates. And now, even planting a bug in his bag to spy on our family, this is just too much. No matter how careful I am, and even if Mike stands by me, I can't live in peace if this continues. If we get married and start our life together, she might secretly install surveillance cameras all over our place. I can't endure a life like that. As I trembled in fear, my mother, who was with us, spoke. Neither of you did anything wrong. It's you who's gone too far. I understand being concerned about your child. But they have their own privacy too. What you're doing is a violation of their human rights. My mother spoke in a calm yet strong tone. Megan glared up at her, continuing to spit venomous words. Don't act all high and mighty. You tricked our employees to benefit your own company. It's true what they say about people from incomplete families being somehow flawed. My mother didn't back down and retorted. You're the flawed one. Your abnormal obsession with Mike, your vile words against Emily during your speech, I won't forgive any of it. My mother never backed down. In place of my late father, she threw herself into her business. Yet, she never forgot to shower me with love. Now, she was genuinely angry for my sake. I felt a deep respect for my strong, kind mother. As Megan and my mother glared at each other, Mike stepped in. I agree entirely with Amanda. I'm not a child anymore. I don't need your surveillance. You ruined our wedding with your prejudice and malice. You hurt Emily deeply. I can't forgive you. From today, I'm cutting ties with both you and dad. She looked shocked, tears welling up in her eyes. Why? I was only worried about you. I wanted you to live a proper life. Is that so wrong? Mike didn't waver and denied her. Even if your concern was genuine, your methods are wrong. As for the company, neglecting employee management and welfare for cost-cutting and the embezzlement, I can't forgive it as a working professional. Mom, you always have conspicuous high-end bags and clothes, but weren't those bought with embezzled money? No. I'm the president. It's normal to earn enough to buy such things. Even so, the mismatched company books and surveillance footage are facts. It's over. We're no longer family. I won't inherit the company either. I'm cutting ties and marrying Emily. Faced with her son's ultimatum, her face was streaked with tears. Her heavy makeup smeared, making her look grotesquely disheveled. Please, don't say that. I'll manage the company properly. I'll resolve the embezzlement issues. I'll aim for a sound business from now on. I'll stop monitoring you. You're our only son. Please don't leave us. Joseph, sitting next to Megan, joined her plea. That's right. We may have been a bit lax, but cutting ties is too extreme. Go home and think it over calmly. Even with both of them pleading, Mike remained resolute. No, this isn't a spur-of-the-moment decision. When I found out about the stalking and embezzlement, I decided to cut ties when I got married. I've already discussed it with Emily and Amanda. It's final. We'll talk through our lawyers from now on. Goodbye. His declaration was firm. His posture was straight a stark contrast to when he couldn't even think of ignoring Megan's calls. I felt a sense of reliance on him, and I knew from the bottom of my heart that marrying him was the right choice. We quickly changed our clothes, 
apologized to the host and staff, and left the venue, leaving the still distraught couple in the waiting room. After that, Mike successfully severed ties with his parents. At the same time, he looked forward to our new life together with excitement. I also heard from Mike that his parents were being tried for embezzlement. Apparently, his accusation about them buying brand name items with embezzled money was correct. They had squandered the company's money on expensive purchases and trips, and even incurred debts. According to the executive who exposed them at the wedding, the company's finances were in such a mess that the books couldn't be publicly shown, leading to a major scandal. They were sentenced to prison, and both are now serving their sentences. With all the employees headhunted and the CEO arrested, the company, of course, went bankrupt. The huge debt left behind will now be repaid by Joseph and Megan. Afterward, Mike officially started working at my mother's company. Of course, he remained in the same department, working alongside me. We promised to build trust and maintain a good relationship both at work and in our private lives. To celebrate Mike's new job, his transition, and our marriage, my mother, Mike, and I had a meal at our favorite delicious restaurant. The day was filled with lively conversations about work and trivial matters, confirming the bond we would share as a family from now on. A lot has happened, but I'm really glad to see you both so happy now. That's what matters most to me. And remember, honesty and sincerity are paramount in both work and family. I know you two will be fine, but just don't forget that." My mother said jokingly with a glass of wine in her hand. She looked cheerful yet dependable. Beside her, Mike, who had matured significantly over the past few months, nodded with a big smile. Seeing the two of them, I vowed to cherish them forever. Later, my mother expertly managed the company, which had seen a significant increase in employees, boosting sales and expanding to open a new branch the following year. At home, Mike and I got along well, and at work, we took on the responsibility of the company's system management as a trusted duo, earning great trust from our colleagues. Someday, we might have a child together. That would surely bring even more joy to my mother. With such thoughts in mind, we continue to lead happy, fulfilling days filled with smiles both at work and at home. It was my husband William's birthday party, and we were spending the day together with our son's family. Our grandson Adam brought out a rolled-up sheet of drawing paper as a present. Happy birthday, Grandpa! William received it, saying, Thank you. He absolutely adores Adam. The drawings he receives from Adam are always framed and displayed throughout our house. On this special birthday, a present from Adam would be particularly meaningful for William. I was excited to see how overjoyed he would look. With a loving smile, William slowly and carefully unrolled the drawing. However, the moment he saw the contents of the gift, he crumpled it up. Then, he threw it aside. Hey, what are you doing? I hurriedly picked it up and smoothed out the crumpled drawing. Upon closer inspection, it appeared to be a portrait of him. What do you think you're doing, William? Adam must have put so much effort into drawing it, and I couldn't believe William would treat it like this. I lashed out in anger. He should have known that Adam drew it thinking of him, so why would he do such a thing? However, William remained silent, staring intently at me. Can't you see? As he said that, he grabbed the hem of Adam's shirt and lifted it up on the spot. My name is Natalie. I'm a 55-year-old housewife. I met my husband, William, through a friend's introduction and retied the knot after about two years of dating. We've been walking together for nearly 30 years since then. William has a serious personality, but at the same time, he has a childlike side. Like a big kid, he laughs a lot, eats heartily, and scolds properly when he needs to. His charm hasn't changed even now. 
As I pulled out an old album and flipped through it, a photo from when our son was born caught my eye. Gazing at the picture of our newborn son, I recalled William's words from that day. Let's name him Stephen. On the day our son was born, he said that while looking at the sleeping baby nestled beside me. I've been thinking about it for a long time. Since I can't give birth to our child myself, I wanted to at least put all my effort into choosing a name. I love that earnest side of him. As I turned the page of the album, there was a photo of me with my art class students. I decided to quit my job and become a full-time housewife when I got pregnant with our firstborn, Stephen. However, I found it challenging to adjust to the leisurely pace of staying at home. Despite being pregnant, I took up a part-time job as an art instructor. Once a week, I taught a small class of five to six students at a nearby community center, guiding them through various art projects. I had always enjoyed painting as a hobby, dedicating my free time on weekends to creating art. After giving birth, I transformed a spare room in our house into a private art studio. This room became a special space, filled with art supplies and mannequins for still life drawings. Remember when Stephen was just a baby and he got so startled by the drawing mannequin that he burst into tears? I reminisced with a smile, looking back on my son's childhood memories. There was the beaming grin on his face when he won first place in the elementary school race. The tense, stiff expression he wore at his middle school entrance ceremony, nervousness written all over his face. The joy radiating from him as he slipped on the uniform of his dream high school after acing the entrance exams. The tears of frustration streaming down his cheeks after losing a crucial game with his school club. The determined, hopeful look in his eyes as he set off for college, ready to embark on a new chapter. And then there was the wedding photo from just five years ago, capturing a moment of pure bliss. He walked alongside his bride, Emily, both of them wearing the biggest smiles I had ever seen. Emily looked stunning with her chestnut hair adorned by a lovely tiara, her happiness mirroring Stephen's as they strode together. Both William and I thought they made a wonderful couple, and the entire family showered them with heartfelt congratulations. As it turned out, Emily had fallen head over heels for Stephen at first sight and boldly made the first move, kick-starting their romance. When Stephen introduced her to the family, it became clear that Emily was a woman passionate about sports and health. Did you know Emily used to play soccer in college? Stephen mentioned. Really? That's surprising. I responded. I responded. People often tell me they wouldn't have guessed I was into sports, Emily laughed. So you're a soccer enthusiast? I inquired. The conversation flowed effortlessly as they discussed Emily's favorite teams and the positions she played. While I didn't know much about soccer, William eagerly joined in, bonding with his new DIL over their shared interest. Stephen and I could only listen in from the sidelines, struggling to keep up with their lively exchange. Before long, Emily and Stephen welcomed a baby boy into the world. The album contained a precious photo of newborn Adam, swaddled in a blanket, fast asleep. William and I were overjoyed at the arrival of our first grandchild. After much discussion, Stephen and Emily decided to buy a house, moving out of their rented apartment to establish their own family home. The first time William and I got to meet Adam in person was when we visited Stephen and Emily's newly built home. Until then, we had only seen our grandson's face through video calls, but being in his presence made his cuteness even more extraordinary. William was completely enamored with his grandson, playing with him with an enthusiasm I had never seen before. He must have been overjoyed. You're so adorable, Adam. It's Grandpa. William made funny faces and stuck out his tongue, eliciting gleeful laughter from Adam. I didn't know William was so good with kids. I didn't miss the slightly wary look Emily gave him. Once Adam started attending preschool, Emily returned to work. 
Stephen and Emily's house was about an hour's drive from our place. On days when preschool was closed, the working couple would drop Adam off with us. I'm really sorry for always imposing on you like this. Emily said apologetically, looking impeccable in her tailored suit and flawless business makeup. Don't worry about it. William is more than happy to take care of Adam. Adam, welcome. What do you want to play today? Come on out, Adam. Grandpa's here to play with you. Don't hide behind your mom. At first, Adam was shy and clung to Emily, hiding behind her. But as he played with William, perhaps drawn to his playful spirit, he gradually opened up. He explored every corner of the house, curiosity leading him from room to room. Taking advantage of a moment when William's attention was elsewhere, Adam wandered into my art studio. It happened to be a day when my students were coming, and they were just starting to gather. Oh, Adam, what brings you here? Weird face! Adam said, pointing at me. I was taken aback for a second before realizing he was actually pointing at the mannequin I used for sketching. Ah, uh, you mean this. Surrounded by the arriving students, Adam's shyness returned, and he hurried out of the room. Your grandson is so cute, Natalie. My students teased good-naturedly as they settled in to paint still life that day. As I was cleaning up after the lesson, he appeared again. He peeked out shyly from behind the door, watching me intently. What's the matter? I asked, and Adam replied bashfully. I wanted to see that weird face again. He seemed to be referring to the sketching mannequin from earlier. I took the mannequin down from the shelf and brought it to Adam's eye level. He touched it with curiosity and let out a wow in amazement. Then, he pulled out a sketchbook and a pen he had brought with him and started drawing something with intense focus. It vaguely resembled the sketching mannequin. Could it be? Adam, do you like drawing? Yeah. I love it. Adam mumbled, completely absorbed in his artwork. From then on, whenever he came over, he spent most of his time in the art studio. Of course, William felt a little lonely. He loved playing with Adam, but he wasn't particularly interested in drawing. It's wonderful to have something you're passionate about. Who knows, maybe you'll become a famous artist in the future. William said as he framed his drawings and put them on display. Adam kept sketching the mannequin until he got bored of it. None of my students showed as much dedication to their art as he did. Adam, how about using this color here? I suggested, and he eagerly filled in the area with the crayon. When a vivid depiction of the mannequin emerged, even Adam himself was surprised, his eyes shining with excitement. We were having a great time, but Emily was not happy about the situation. Adam, did you get your hands dirty with crayons again? It's even on your clothes. Emily would inevitably yell when she came to pick him up. Don't get so angry. It's washable crayons, so it'll come right off. How does this happen under your supervision? Please keep a better eye on him. Emily's anger stemmed from more than just the mess. As a soccer enthusiast, she wanted him to play soccer too. That's why she didn't like me teaching him how to draw. He's always drawing at home too. It's because you keep teaching him, Natalie. Emily, that's not true. This is his individuality. No, it's your fault, Natalie. That's why he's not doing well in soccer practice. Fuming, she took Adam's hand and left. She had been sending him to soccer club twice a week. Recently, he apparently didn't perform as well as expected in a shooting practice test. Emily seemed to be under the misapprehension that his sluggish performance in soccer was my fault. Everyone has their own unique talents and strengths. Emily had a knack for soccer, while Adam had a gift for drawing. Those individual qualities should be respected, 
but it appeared that his talents weren't being acknowledged. It's a tough situation. Don't worry, she will come around and understand eventually. William reassured, but Emily's insistence on pushing Adam into soccer only escalated. One rainy day when Adam came over, he looked tired and sleepy. Usually, he was full of energy, so I asked him what was wrong. I'm tired from the strength training. Strength training? Apparently, on top of soccer club practice, Emily had instructed him to do extra training at home. Even when I say I don't want to, she won't let me stop. So you're only doing it because you have to. No wonder your performance isn't improving. Adam nodded weakly. I decided to inform Stephen about this. He was surprised and said, What? Emily told me Adam was doing extra practice because he likes soccer. After that phone call, Stephen began to observe Emily's behavior more closely. She wasn't scolding Adam and forcing him to do strength training. However, he noticed that she was using a stern tone to make him do the extra practice. Come on, hurry up. 20 sit-ups and 20 push-ups each. Stephen saw Adam making a face, struggling to endure it. Emily, isn't it enough that he's doing it at the club? He doesn't need to do strength training at home too. When he pointed this out, Emily raised her voice. Consistency is key for this kind of thing. But he looks like he's really suffering. Of course strength training isn't easy. You're an amateur, so don't interfere. Faced with her stubborn anger, Stephen was at a loss. He tried to bring it up again later, but this time she completely ignored him. As this pattern continued, Stephen finally came to me for help. I don't think it'll make a difference if I say something, but... Despite my doubts, I told Emily to stop forcing Adam to do strength training. Natalie, stay out of this, please. Emily snapped, and from then on, she stubbornly ignored anything I said. She seemed to despise me even more, and from then on, she stopped dropping Adam off at our house altogether. On days when Stephen and Emily were at work and preschool was closed, he was apparently left alone at home. Leaving a five-year-old child unsupervised was considered dangerous. Stephen shared this concern and had tried to reason with Emily. Hey, Emily. Don't you think it's better to have someone watch him on days like this? You mean, leave him with Natalie? You've got to be kidding me. She stubbornly refused to agree. However, Stephen must have been worried sick. He came to me for my opinion as well. It is indeed worrisome to have Adam staying home alone. When I concurred, Stephen was delighted to have his thoughts validated and happily said, Right? So, is it okay if I leave Adam with you, without telling Emily? We don't mind, but... Keeping Adam's visits a secret from Emily would create a rift of secrecy between the couple. The thought didn't sit well with me. However, the joy of seeing my grandson overpowered my concerns, and I forgot all about it while drawing pictures with him. One sunny Saturday, as I was sketching with Adam, I received a call from Emily. Adam's there with you, isn't he? What? I couldn't hide my surprise. How did Emily find out? I've noticed Stephen acting strange lately, so I checked his phone. At first, she suspected he might be cheating, but that wasn't the case. I found the messages with you, Natalie. Something about leaving Adam with you. It's because it's dangerous to leave Adam alone. I tried desperately to explain, but Emily wouldn't listen at all. I'll give Stephen an earful when he gets home. Don't interfere with our family anymore. Emily abruptly hung up, leaving me feeling upset and unsettled. I never imagined I'd have a falling out with my son's wife over something like this. How long would this situation persist? It felt like wandering through a maze with no exit in sight. Even though Stephen faced Emily's wrath after that, 
he still brought Adam to our house. I finally understand. Adam prefers drawing over soccer. A resolute light shone in his eyes, determined to protect what truly mattered. Seeing his determination, I felt a surge of courage in my own heart. I resolved to focus on nurturing Adam's individuality. I found myself able to think that way. A few months passed, and when the plum blossoms were in bloom, William's birthday arrived. On this day, we always filled the table with William's favorite dishes and invited Stephen's family over to celebrate. It's a bit lonely with just the two of us, don't you think? It's better to have a big group. At the appointed time, Stephen and his family arrived, and the party began. As we chatted about recent events and enjoyed the delicious food, I noticed Adam's unusual behavior. He seemed restless, hiding what looked like a sheet of drawing paper behind his back. Adam, you brought a present for Grandpa today, right? Emily said with a smile, encouraging Adam. Come on, be brave and give it to him. However, Adam appeared embarrassed and kept his head down. William gently spoke to him, trying to help him out. Did you draw something? Can you show Grandpa? Adam pulled out the rolled up drawing paper and presented it. Happy birthday, Grandpa! William said. Thank you! As he accepted the gift. With a loving smile, he slowly and carefully unrolled it. A present from his beloved Adam should be extra special for William. I was curious to see what was drawn and tried to peek, but at that moment. The instant William saw the picture, he crumpled it up. Then, with trembling hands, he crumpled it further and threw it away. Hey, what are you doing? I hurriedly picked it up and smoothed out the crumpled drawing. Upon closer inspection, it appeared to be a portrait of William. What are you doing? Apologize. Adam must have put his heart into drawing it, so how could William treat it like this? I lashed out in anger. Adam had surely drawn it thinking of William, so why? William remained unperturbed and stared intently at me. He had a habit of staring at people like that when he was quietly angry. Can't you see? Saying that, William grabbed the hem of Adam's shirt and lifted it up on the spot. Whoa! Adam was startled and nearly lost his balance but managed to steady himself. Beneath the lifted shirt, several small bruises were visible. What? Is this? I looked at William. He pointed his chin at the drawing paper, his eyes urging me to take a closer look. A portrait of William was sketched on the paper. However, upon closer inspection, the positions of his moles and the shape of his nose were slightly off. There were also blue spots on the body part below the portrait. Moreover, in the corner of the paper, the words help me were written in small letters. I had a sinking feeling. Could these blue spots represent bruises on his body? Was the person in the portrait doing something to him? As these thoughts crossed my mind, I glanced at William and he nodded deeply. It seemed we were thinking the same thing. Someone was harming Adam. William had sensed the danger to his beloved Adam and crumpled the drawing in anger. How could this be happening? As William trembled with rage, Stephen asked in a puzzled tone. Dad, Mom, what's going on? Stephen also came over to Adam and gasped at his painful appearance. Adam? How did you get those bruises? I must have turned pale. With a sinking feeling, I showed Adam's drawing to Stephen. He was shocked too. This drawing isn't dad. He exclaimed. What's the meaning of this? Tell us the truth. Adam burst into tears, startled by the commotion. Seeing this, Emily rushed over and hugged Adam protectively, saying, Stop it! Those bruises are from soccer practice! Mommy is a liar! For the first time, he rejected Emily and pulled away from her arms. 
You and the coach bullied me. Stephen, William, and I were all confused. I don't even know the person in the portrait. Mommy made me draw it. After saying this in one breath, Adam started crying again, wailing loudly. Emily, looking flustered, stammered. Well, you see. While all this was happening, Adam revealed everything, bit by bit. Emily had instructed him to draw a portrait of Grandpa for the birthday party. However, the person in the photo she showed him was an unfamiliar man. When he refused, saying he didn't want to draw it, she insisted that he draw that man's portrait. He was told that this was his new grandpa and was ordered to give the drawing to William at today's birthday party. After hearing everything, the gazes of William, Stephen, and myself all converged on Emily at once. Everyone's eyes were demanding an explanation, asking what was going on. When Emily realized that everyone there was on Adam's side, she sighed in resignation. I found someone else to be his new father. I wanted him to think of this man as his dad. Him? You mean you were cheating? I had already decided to be with him. She spoke in a flat tone, a malicious smile playing on her lips. Emily said that she deeply resented the fact that William and I were seeing Adam. She thought that we were taking him away from her. You two love Adam so much. I thought that if you were rejected by your grandson, it would hurt you. She had intended to brainwash him into believing that her new boyfriend was his father. Then, by making him reject his grandparents, she wanted to laugh at the sight of us being hurt by him. If Adam rejected us with his own words, she could also blame it on him. And she had planned to use that as an excuse to ask for a divorce. However, Adam had not accepted Emily's boyfriend to the extent that she had hoped. This was something that even Emily hadn't anticipated. That's why this plan failed. Seriously, what a useless child. She glared at him resentfully. I don't need any of you here. With those words, she stormed out. Only Stephen chased after her. Emily, wait. What do you mean, you're going to be with your boyfriend? But a few minutes later, he returned, looking dejected. Emily had jumped into a passing taxi and sped away. Later, a text message arrived on his phone. I'm going back to my parents' house. That was all it said, so he had turned back. In that case, let's contact Emily's parents and have them keep an eye on her. At William's suggestion, Stephen nodded in agreement. A few days later, on a day that was warm for the season, almost spring-like, they called Emily over to the house for a discussion. The four of U.S. William, Stephen, Emily, and I were gathered in the living room. I want you to take a look at this. Stephen tossed an envelope containing documents onto the table. It was a report from the private investigator he had hired to look into Emily's activities. Ever since Adam started attending soccer club, Emily's appearance had gradually begun to change. At first, we didn't pay much attention to it. However, Stephen became suspicious when she frequently visited beauty salons and changed her makeup. What was even more decisive was when he accidentally saw her exchanges on her smartphone. The person she was talking to wasn't a friend or acquaintance, but a man he didn't know at all. I was shaken when I saw messages like I want to see you again and I like you with heart marks. Stephen said in a cold manner. Looking at the investigation results, it turned out that the man was a coach from the soccer club. Emily stared at the documents without trying to hide anything. I was planning to tell you after dad's birthday party when the timing was right. Stephen spoke in a matter of fact tone, but like William, he was quietly angry. I regret not bringing it up sooner. Emily said nothing. After she ran away, we took Adam to the hospital to have his bruises examined. They had turned blue and red, and Adam told us that they were painful. Upon hearing this, the doctor said that he might have been beaten on a regular basis. 
The club met twice a week, but was he being hit every time? Or was he being hit by Emily while practicing at home? Adam kept his mouth shut and didn't say anything. Emily, were you the one who told Adam to keep quiet? I would never do such a thing. I'm so disappointed in you, bullying Adam while having an affair behind our backs. But I just wanted to blow off some steam. That's why. Don't give me that nonsense. Scolded by Stephen, Emily hung her head powerlessly as he thrust divorce papers at her. We're getting a divorce. Sign this and get out of here. Yeah, fine with me. Emily signed her name without hesitation. Just then, the sound of a car pulling up outside could be heard. Emily looked puzzled, but when I let them into the house, her expression froze. Why, are dad and mom here? We've made arrangements to hand you over to your parents. Before Emily could utter another word, she was dragged away by her parents. All that was left was the hollow sound of the car driving away. The next day, Stephen submitted the divorce papers to the city hall, and they were successfully accepted. He then asked an acquaintance to introduce him to a lawyer and demanded compensation from Emily and her lover. After paying the compensation, her affair became known at her company, making it uncomfortable for her to stay, so she quit. The man she was involved with didn't get off with just paying compensation. The fact that he had an affair with a student's mother became widely known, and he was fired from the soccer club. It was a relatively large club in the area, so rumors spread among the club members and the parents involved. The former coach became unemployed, and even after getting together with Emily, he is dependent on her for support. She is the one supporting him, working herself to the bone as a supermarket cashier and such. Occasionally, we receive messages from her saying, I want to see Adam. Both Stephen and I have decided to ignore those messages. She has been served with a restraining order to stay away from Adam. We probably won't respond for about six months. Stephen sold the house he had bought and moved in with Adam. Adam is now living with William and me. Dad, Grandpa, look! Oh my! That's Grandpa, isn't it? Let me see. Adam proudly unfolded the finished drawing to show us. On the paper, William's smiling face was drawn large. The positions of the moles and the shape of the nose were just like William's. You've drawn it so well. Let's frame it. As William got up from his seat, Adam laughed. He looked so happy. The bruises on Adam's body healed remarkably after he came to live with us. The doctor had the quick thinking to take x-rays to check for fractures. I still vividly remember the relief we felt when not a single crack was found. He quit the soccer club and is now thriving both at preschool and at home. At home, I teach him drawing, which he loves, while watching him grow. Although the wounds on his young body have healed, I suddenly worried that there might be some lingering scars on his heart. Next, I'm going to draw Granny, he declared. Watch me, he said as he filled the drawing paper with my face. His free use of colors and gestures revealed a child's uninhibited sensibility. As I observed him, I laughed, realizing that my worries seemed to be unfounded after all. Really? Being late because you were helping a pregnant woman on the side of the road is such a cliché excuse. Are you kidding me? On the day of my son's wedding, I made a terrible mistake. In my desperation to get a pregnant woman in labor into my car and to the hospital, I completely forgot about my son's wedding. Stella, who was supposed to become my son's wife, was furious, breathing heavily in a way I'd never seen before, her facial muscles trembling with anger. This was entirely my fault. I need to apologize sincerely. Relatives are walking towards the reception venue. The sound of stones hitting the ground echoes in my ears. Stella looks at my dress, pointing at various spots with a puzzled expression. 
It's because when I helped the pregnant woman, her water broke and stained my dress. Unbelievable. How can you show up looking so dirty? And the smell. Are you happy ruining my wedding? I'm so sorry, Stella. I'll get changed right away and try to make it to the reception in time. I don't care if it's true or not, but putting others first like this is unacceptable. You're a failure as a parent. Please leave immediately without showing your face to Joseph. Stella, in her dress, removed a hair ornament she was wearing and threw it at me. The hair ornament must have been light and landed at my feet. If it were me, I'd come here no matter if someone had collapsed in the middle of the road or if there was a car accident. Today is that important of a day. Her anger didn't subside, and she grabbed stones from the ground and threw them at my face with all her might. Ouch, Stella, stop. I shield my face and get into my car. After hitting the car's windshield hard. Go home. Stella yelled. I gripped the steering wheel. It seems I won't be able to attend my son's wedding, and my relationship with Stella is completely broken. But, if my son Joseph can be happy, then this is for the best. It's all my fault today. I should just go home. Just as I was thinking this, there was a small knock on the passenger side window. It was a very unexpected person. My name is Scarlett. I lost my husband in a traffic accident when I was young and raised my son Joseph on my own. After graduating from college, Joseph got a job at a major electronics manufacturer. Finally, standing on his own two feet, he is now dating a woman he met at a party. The fact that my son became independent made me let my guard down, and the pain in my body I had been ignoring until now has started to stand out recently. I quit my job as a nurse, which I had been doing for a long time, and am unemployed now. I'm living modestly, dipping into my savings. It's regrettable that I have to rely somewhat on Joseph's income. In my mind, my son is still the boy who would call out. Mom! and happily bring me snacks from the candy corner. My cute son of those times and the Joseph now with his stubble are the same person, right? I think to myself. Joseph, after work at night, always wears the same gray sweatpants and drinks while watching TV. But on weekends, he takes a shower in the morning, shaves his beard meticulously, and takes care of his eyebrows. He spends over 30 minutes in front of the mirror, then goes straight back to his room. After changing into a neat appearance, he comes out satisfied, takes out coffee from the fridge, and pours it into a cup. Going out today? A date? It's not really a date. I'm thinking of taking a walk along the river with her. After drinking the coffee heartily enough that I can hear it going down his throat, he brushes his teeth and then hurries off to meet his girlfriend. I take the newspaper out of the mailbox, pull out today's flyers, and put on my glasses. Now, which supermarket has the best deals today? Ever since I got married, it has been my daily routine to check the flyers like this every morning. Meat from this supermarket, vegetables from that one. After marking some flyers with a red pen, I suddenly tilt my head. Dressing up just for a walk. Does she really enjoy that? Joseph never wastes money unnecessarily, perhaps because I always nag him about saving money. As a child, he showed no interest in toys or video games, instead drawing on the back of newspaper flyers every day. Even his pencils and paints were hand-me-downs from a neighbor. Yet, Joseph never complained and seemed happy drawing every day. That day, I was cleaning from the morning, and by mid-afternoon, the doorbell rang. Who could it be? I wondered, opening the door to find Joseph standing there. What is it? Why did you ring the doorbell? Mom. There's someone I want you to meet. With a slightly embarrassed expression, Joseph introduced a young woman wearing a white dress standing behind him. Her slender, delicate arms suited the white dress perfectly. Despite it being the middle of winter, the woman, dressed in just a thin dress and a lace shawl, looked as beautiful as a fairy. Hello. My name is Stella. I'm dating Joseph. It's nice to meet you. The woman who introduced herself as Stella greeted me with a clear voice and a lovely smile. 
Joseph then said to Stella, Please, come in. And led her to the living room. As I was looking for some snacks to serve them, Joseph came into the kitchen, so I playfully tapped his head. If you were going to bring someone, you should have told me. I'm completely unprepared when you just show up like this. Eh? Oh, sorry. Stella didn't want to tell you about coming over because she wanted to see our home as it is. As it is, huh? I'm relieved I cleaned up in the morning. As we talked a bit, Joseph, with a serious look, told me he was considering marrying Stella. Joseph is over 30 now, and I had been bracing myself for a day like this to come. Still, the thought that the days of just mom and son might be coming to an end. It makes my heart ache a bit. Suddenly, Joseph's mobile phone rang, and he excused himself saying, Sorry. It's a call from work. And left the room. Left alone with Stella, we chatted about trivial things until Stella pointed at a painting of the sea on the wall drawn by Joseph. Is that one drawn by Joseph? Yes, it is. It's a bit see-through on the back because it's drawn on the back of a flyer, but it's a nice painting, isn't it? Stella stood up to take a closer look at the painting Joseph had made. A blue sea and a blue sky. Nothing else, just an expanse of sea painted entirely with blue paint. The blue sea spread out with just blue, and in the blue sky, two small clouds floated. Joseph and I went to the beach for a swim just once when he was a child. I explained to Stella that this was a painting of the sea from that time. After silently staring at the painting for a while, Stella sat down quietly in front of me and said, This painting is very sad. Eh? Really? Oh, I always thought it was a happy painting of us playing at the beach. Is that so? Normally, if you go to the beach, wouldn't you draw yourself swimming? Stella said this to me as if making a clear statement. In this painting of the sea, there is only the blue sky and the blue sea. She declared that surely there were no happy memories of the beach, just a record of the first time seeing the sea captured in the painting. And on a flyer, no less. She criticized me for not even providing proper drawing paper, despite his talent for painting. Joseph is a wonderful person. You should have given him a richer life. He has talent in his painting, and you are surely the one who crushed it. That's not. Joseph never said he wanted to study painting seriously, I thought it was just a hobby. Surely he understood from a young age that the household was poor. Being raised in a single-parent home must have been hard for Joseph. Stella took out a clean white handkerchief from her bag and pressed it against her slightly moist eyes. Until Joseph returned from his call, Stella explained how Joseph has always been frugal. Listening to her, I was filled with remorse from the bottom of my heart. I was a saver, and I had instilled that in Joseph. Having been like this since childhood, perhaps Joseph, even as an adult, naturally practices it and is called a saver by everyone. Maybe Joseph had been complaining to Stella about not being able to afford luxuries as a child. Perhaps I was indeed a terrible mom as Stella said. Joseph came back after finishing his call. Stella, as if forgetting all our previous conversation, asked if there was an old album of Joseph's childhood or something. While looking through the nostalgic old albums, Joseph and Stella talked happily about what photos to use for their wedding. Stella seems not to have a job and lives at her parents' house, helping with household chores. Thrifty Joseph and Stella, who lives with her parents, seem to make an effort not to spend money, often walking in the neighborhood park. Looking at photos of Joseph when he was young in the album. We walked here the other day. She says with a gentle smile, truly angelic. A whole year was about to pass since our first meeting. Joseph and Stella continued to date smoothly, and from what I've heard, they got along well without any major arguments. Sometimes when they came to visit, Stella would look at the painting of the sea on the wall and murmur sadly. Poor thing. So one day, I took it down from the wall and hid it in a corner of a shelf. I wanted to avoid anything that might worsen Stella's impression of me. Later, I had the chance to meet Stella's parents. Stella's parents seemed kind and gentle, impressed by how I had raised my son alone after losing my husband at a young age. 
Stella, not seeming amused, listened in silence. Even now, with the wedding imminent, a heavy atmosphere lingered between me and her. Then came the wedding day. The weather forecast promised clear skies all day. Blessed with fantastic weather, it was warm and pleasant despite being midwinter, with no wind. I managed to dress myself in a gown borrowed from a relative and wore sneakers to drive to the venue. I left home with more than an hour to spare. On the way, I stopped at a grocery store to buy a drink and noticed a woman crouched in a corner of the parking lot. I thought she was just sitting, but I could faintly hear moaning, so I approached. Are you okay? The woman sitting didn't respond to my voice. Instead, she was breathing heavily, desperately gripping the hem of her dress. I realized she was pregnant and that she had just gone into labor. I was a nurse once, so I've seen this situation many times. In as calm a voice as I could muster, I smiled and said, Can you get into my car? I'll take you to the hospital. The pregnant woman looked surprised, but then told me her regular doctor was at the city hospital. After laying her in the back seat, it seemed her water had broken, as amniotic fluid dripped down her thighs. I rushed back into the grocery store to buy a towel and wrapped it around her waist. After calling the hospital to inform them of her condition, I started driving. Lying down, she was contacting what seemed to be her husband on her mobile phone. I considered calling an ambulance, but decided driving her myself would be faster since the roads were clear. It's okay, calm down. We'll be at the hospital soon. Just breathe deeply and try to relax. Let me know if you're cold, I can lend you my jacket or anything. In the car, I kept encouraging the pregnant woman. Upon reaching the hospital, I quickly handed her over to the medical staff waiting in the parking lot, and I felt a wave of exhaustion as the tension left me. After explaining the situation to the nurses, I was sitting in the waiting room resting and drinking juice when two men approached me. They were the husband and father of the woman I had just helped. Both in suits, they must have been at work. They bowed repeatedly. Thank you so much. Thanking me. I mentioned I used to be a nurse. She will definitely give birth safely. And smiled. Then I noticed something. The father, an elderly man, was dressed in formal attire. Seeing him, I snapped back to reality and remembered. Right. I must hurry to the venue or I'll be terribly late. Cutting short their words of thanks, I said. Sorry, I have to be somewhere. And quickly returned to my car to rush to the venue. Despite my haste, I arrived significantly late. The group photos were already done and they were about to move to the reception. Then, I saw Stella in her wedding dress. Her face, peeking out from the pure white dress, was even more beautiful than usual taking my breath away. Escorted by the staff, she walked step by step, like a lily flower in bloom. But the next moment, Stella's eyes met mine exactly. Then, ignoring the staff, she ran towards me with a face filled with anger. I'm sorry, you see. On my way here, I came across a pregnant woman who had just started labor. What? Helping a pregnant woman on the side of the road is such a cliché excuse. Are you kidding me? I desperately tried to think of an excuse to prove it wasn't a lie, but couldn't come up with anything. I explained that I was so focused on getting the pregnant woman into my car and to the hospital that I completely forgot about the ceremony. Stella was angry, breathing heavily in a way I've never seen before, her facial muscles trembling. It was as if she was about to physically attack me, and I apologized earnestly. This was entirely my fault. I sincerely needed to apologize. Thinking about how Joseph would have been looked down upon by the attendees for having his parents' seat empty hurt me. Stella pointed at various spots on the dress I was wearing, her face forming a puzzled expression. It was because the fluid had stained my dress when I was assisting the woman whose water had broken. Unbelievable! How can you show up in such a dirty state? And the smell. This is too much. Are you happy ruining my wedding? I'm so sorry, Stella. I'll get changed right away and try to make it at least to the reception in time. I don't know if it's true or not, 
but putting others first like this is unacceptable. You're a failure as a parent. Please leave immediately without seeing Joseph. Stella slowly removed a hair ornament she was wearing and threw it at me. The hair ornament must have been light and landed at my feet. Her anger didn't seem to subside as she grabbed stones from the ground and threw them at my face with all her might. Ouch, Stella, stop. If it were me, no matter if someone had collapsed on the road or there was a traffic accident, I would come here. Today is that important of a day. Despite Stella's words, calling an ambulance would have been slower than me driving her. Yet, I didn't have time to make such excuses as Stella kept throwing stones at me. I shielded my face and got into my car. After Stella hit the car's windshield hard, she yelled. Go home! I gripped the steering wheel. It seemed I wouldn't be able to attend my son's wedding, and my relationship with Stella was completely broken. But if it meant Joseph could be happy, then it was worth it. It was all my fault today. I was thinking of just going home. Just then, there was a small knock on the passenger side window. I stiffened and looked in that direction. The father of the pregnant woman I had taken to the hospital was looking at me with a refreshing smile. Huh? I just saw you at. As I opened the window halfway, the elderly man smiled even more warmly at me. I'm sorry I couldn't thank you properly before. My name is Anderson. I got out of the car, glancing at Stella still furious nearby, and bowed slightly before Mr. Anderson. The man who introduced himself as Anderson handed me a business card from a neat jacket. It bore the name of the company where Joseph worked, and seeing his title, I involuntarily covered my mouth. CEO. Are you the president of the company where Joseph works? Anderson smiled broadly and nodded. I had heard that Joseph's boss was coming, but I never imagined it would be the president himself. I admired Joseph's boldness for inviting him, but this wasn't the time for that. I'm embarrassed you had to see such a scene. As I apologized to Mr. Anderson, he shook his head and looked toward Stella. I was on my way to the ceremony when I got a call that my pregnant daughter had gone into labor and was taken to the hospital. I'm sorry for being late, Ms. Bride. No, no. If there was such a situation, being late is understandable. Is that so? I'm sorry, but your voice was a bit loud and it reached me. She is a savior to my daughter. I truly regret that her kindness caused you inconvenience. But Mr. Anderson continued that he was more angry than sorry. Mr. Anderson said with a stern expression and tone that I had helped his daughter, who couldn't even call for help because she was in labor. That even the hospital was impressed with how quickly I acted, saying that calling an ambulance wouldn't have been fast enough and could have been dangerous. And that he couldn't forgive anyone who would insult a person who had saved someone dear to him. Stella's face turned pale, and she was speechless. Soon, perhaps worried that the bride had not arrived yet, Joseph hurried over. Upon noticing Mr. Anderson, he immediately bowed deeply. Before I could explain the situation, Mr. Anderson, with a smile, stopped me and explained everything to Joseph. His account was much more exaggerated and kinder than anything I could have said. He described how a brave and wonderful woman had helped a pregnant woman, leading to her late arrival at the important ceremony, and how Stella, failing to understand, had thrown stones at me. Indeed, as befits the president of a large company, his explanation was very skillful. Joseph, who had been listening intently, was visibly shocked. Sensing the tense atmosphere, Stella's parents approached with concerned looks on their faces. Worried this might turn into a condemnation of Stella and ruin the wedding. I apologized to Mr. Anderson and to Stella as well. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. It's all my fault for not coming to the venue right away. Yes, that's right. Normally, wouldn't you change at the venue? Why did you come from home already dressed? Um, because I was told that using the dressing room at the venue would cost extra. I involuntarily shrank. Indeed, she was right. I could have sent the dress to the venue and changed there, using a dressing room. 
but I hesitated because of the extra costs for sending the dress and using the changing room. I had heard that the wedding expenses were carefully saved up by Joseph and Stella themselves. I didn't want to inflate the costs just because of me. Thinking so turned out to be a mistake. Poor Joseph, having to live with such a poor mom. How sad for him. How much more do you plan to make him suffer? My vision went white, and I placed a hand on my forehead and looked up at the sky. What a blue sky. What a perfect wedding it could have been, had I not been late. As I nearly collapsed, a large hand supported me from behind. Joseph firmly gripped my shoulder, staring at Stella. His eyes were not those of the kind son I knew, but rather cold. Mom was very good at saving money, making sacrifices so that I could attend university without needing student loans. I'm very grateful. Joseph. It's true we were poor, but Mom always put me first, raising me with lots of love. You have no right to say she made me suffer. I had always regretted making Joseph live a modest life since meeting Stella. Not being able to buy him the games he wanted, nor taking him to amusement parks. I thought maybe he resented having a forced saving mentality due to our poverty, not being able to say I want this, or I want to go somewhere. That's how I thought about Joseph. I'm sorry, Stella. But after you've insulted mom like this, I can't imagine a life with you anymore. Let's call off the engagement. What? Don't be ridiculous. Don't be such a mama's boy. Stella's expression snapped with Joseph's unexpected declaration of calling off the engagement. Once as beautiful as a white fairy, her skin turned bright red, and mascara ran down from her tears, looking witch-like. As she cried and screamed like a demon, no one knew how to react, watching from a distance. Joseph spoke to her quietly, though his words likely didn't reach her ears. Still, he spoke in a calm, gentle voice. Disregarding savings and mocking poverty is prejudice. Saving is necessary for the future. Instead of ridiculing it, I wished we could respect each other and acknowledge diversity. I looked at Joseph's profile, which looked lonely. I thought he must still love her. Thus, the wedding was cancelled. When Stella's parents found out about the situation, they felt responsible and offered to cover all the expenses for the venue. However, Joseph, in his honesty, insisted that he also bore some responsibility and offered to share the costs. Stella's parents were deeply surprised by this. They apologized to me again, saying how sorry they were for what had happened to such a wonderful son. As a result, Stella was disowned by her parents and kicked out of her home. It seems Stella has become completely isolated, with the wedding incident spreading among friends. Now she's reportedly dabbling in unsavory clubs, using her beauty to her advantage. Meanwhile, Mr. Anderson's daughter gave birth safely, and both mother and child are healthy. Hearing this news through Joseph filled me with joy. On a sunny Sunday. As I started cleaning the room, I found the painting of the blue sky and seat tucked away in a corner. It was the painting by Joseph that Stella had called pitiful. Pausing my cleaning, I stared at it for a while until Joseph, just woken up and in his usual worn-out clothes, came out to get coffee from the fridge. What are you looking at? This painting you made when you were little. It used to hang on the wall, remember? Ah, that one. Joseph took a sip of his coffee, his expression unnaturally stiff. Stella said it's pitiful that this painting is on the back of a flyer, implying you were poor. At my words, Joseph snorted with laughter. It's not like I didn't have paper to draw on. And I didn't draw on the back of flyers because we were saving money or anything. What? Really? Yeah. You always looked so closely at the sale flyers, right? I figured if I drew on the back of that day's flyer, you'd definitely see my painting. I was so surprised that I gaped at him. Then, suddenly filled with amusement, I burst out laughing. Joseph, caught by my laughter, joined in, and our home was enveloped in joy. Next time, I'll find a woman who appreciates you too. Saving is also good for the environment, after all. Surely you'll find someone wonderful. I conveyed this sentiment in my heart.
I'll continue to support Joseph from the shadows. My daughter Sharon's husband Christopher suddenly said with a sly smile. I want to take this opportunity and discuss this with you. I had a DNA test taken because I thought she didn't look like me. And it turns out she's not my daughter. Christopher said so pointing at my granddaughter Tiana, who was being held by Sharon. I made an eye contact with my husband Dylan while Christopher was unable to hide his smirk. I figured as much. I was disappointed, but anger quickly overtook me. So you've been cheating on me behind my back? You bastard. Were you having an affair with one of the fathers who picks up their kids from daycare? His raised voice caught the attention of those around us. I felt truly sorry. I still wanted to believe in him. A woman like this is totally untrustworthy. Divorce. I want a divorce. Sharon seemed unable to comprehend Christopher's sudden change. Tiana, sensing something was wrong, started crying and her cries echoing around us. I couldn't believe he was this kind of person. I felt an anger towards him like I had never felt before for neglecting my daughter. Looking over at Dylan, I saw him with an angry expression, fists clenched. This was our only chance. I exchanged glances with Dylan, then took out a photo we had prepared in advance. This photo was our trump card. With hands trembling with anger, I held up the photo in front of Christopher. My name is Violet. I'm a 55-year-old housewife. I live a commonplace life, but I cherish the certain happiness I feel and value the peaceful family life I have. My family consists of my husband Dylan, who currently works at a travel agency, my daughter Sharon, a nursery teacher and my granddaughter Tiana. We are a family of four. Until recently, Christopher, Sharon's husband, who's also an assistant director who works at a TV station lived with us. When he was still in this house, I never dreamed we would end up living separately. Our current life goes back to when I met Dylan. Meeting Dylan was a story from decades ago. Back then, it was common for our marriages to be arranged by our parents. He was five years older, in the prime of his career at a travel agency. He had a manly and serious look about him, which left a good impression on me. Due to his job, he was knowledgeable about geography all over the world. I remember him talking excitedly about the charms of various tourist destinations over dinner. Holding a glass of beer in his hand, he said with enthusiasm, My favorite place is definitely the Pyramids of Egypt. It's what I recommend most to customers. The pyramids, made of limestone, used to shine white, reflecting the sun when they were first built. His carefree smile like a little boy stirred something in my heart. Seeing him like that, I wanted to sit next to him and hear more. I would love for you to take me to your recommended places, Dylan. To that he responded with a smile. Leave it to me. That's how we hit it off, starting a relationship with marriage in mind. Dylan was busy with work, but he always made time for me. His experience in a travel agency showed in how perfectly he planned our dates and trips. I wanted to walk through life with this man. After a few months of dating, I was convinced that we could make a married life work. Please marry me. I want to see the pyramids with you on our honeymoon. It was an unplanned proposal. He stared at me wide-eyed for a few seconds, then broke into a broad smile. Of course. Thank you. Really? I'm sorry I made you say it. Thus, having confirmed our feelings for each other, we officially pledged our love at our wedding a few months later. True to our promise, we went to Egypt to see the pyramids on our honeymoon. That scenery will never fade in my mind, even after many years. In the midst of what could be called the pinnacle of happiness, our daughter Sharon was born. Life with a child passed surprisingly quickly, and before we knew it, Sharon had grown up and become a respectable nursery teacher. Sharon, who always loved children, seemed fulfilled, even though she was often busy with the kids at the nursery. Through her work, she started talking about wanting to get married and have her own children. She came to me for advice when she was 26. Mom, do you remember Nicola from my university? I talked to her about getting married, and she invited me to a party. 
I'm not sure if I should go or not. Seeing my daughter seemingly exhausted from thinking about marriage and kids, I decided to give her a push. Well, isn't this a chance? You can trust an invitation from Nicola. Why not just go and see? Sharon looked somewhat anxious, but eventually decided to go. And so the day of the party came. Sharon left the house wearing fancier clothes than usual. Her makeup, different from her normal style, seemed to be done with extra effort. Dylan and I had dinner alone for the first time in a while. As we ate, Dylan seemed restless. What's wrong? Wasn't the dinner good? I asked half-jokingly, and Dylan replied awkwardly. Of course not. I'm just a bit worried about Sharon. I hope she doesn't get deceived by some strange guy. I felt the same way. After all, I was the one who had encouraged Sharon to go. I guess so. But it's Sharon, she'll be fine. She has a good eye for men. After all, she takes after me in that regard. I guess you're right. I think we both were trying to mask our anxiety with laughter. Then, a few hours later, Sharon returned. When I asked how it went, Sharon said with a smile. There was a great guy there. A really great guy. And she kept repeating how he was a good person. Whether it was from the cold air of January or the excitement of finding someone, her cheeks were flushed. What kind of person is he? Dylan asked and to that Sharon proudly replied. He's part of a TV crew. His name is Christopher. He goes on location shoots and visits all sorts of places. I went on many trips with you too, right? So, we hit it off. Upon hearing this, Dylan frowned slightly. A TV crew, so he's in the entertainment industry, right? I don't have a very good impression of that. How should I put it, didn't he look a bit frivolous? But you're the one who said, men who travel to different places and see various sceneries are trustworthy. He had black hair and didn't look frivolous at all. Well, I did say that, but... I calmed down Dylan, who didn't seem convinced, and told Sharon. Anyway, make sure you date him properly and take your time to find out what kind of person he is. It's late now. You have work tomorrow, right? I urged Sharon, who seemed quite drunk, to go to bed. After that, Sharon and Christopher officially started dating. Their relationship seemed to be going well, and Sharon introduced Christopher to me and Dylan. Christopher, being in the entertainment industry, initially seemed elusive. But after talking to him, he turned out to be very personable. So when they brought up marriage, I genuinely agreed. The best thing is to respect Sharon's choice. Thus, they continued their relationship smoothly and got married two years after meeting. Christopher, wearing an undoubtedly expensive suit, came to greet us formally. He held a bottle of high-end wine in his hand. I was genuinely happy for Sharon's marriage. Sharon's face, brimming with happiness, made it clear she was at the peak of her joy. Thinking back, that might have been the happiest time. Christopher, looking confident, addressed Dylan. I've brought some wine. Let me pour you a glass. Dylan, albeit awkwardly, accepted it. The meal continued in a good atmosphere for a while. It was when the bottom of the wine bottle Christopher brought started to show that the mood changed. You're in the entertainment industry, right? Frankly, I still can't trust you. Dylan's words made me freeze. The room suddenly became quiet, the atmosphere tense. I didn't want to ruin this happy moment. Hey, why are you saying such unpleasant things all of a sudden? I sharply said to Dylan. Sharon then spoke up. That's right. What are you talking about, Dad? That's just prejudice. It's terrible that you can't trust the person I chose. Dylan's frown did not ease even at Sharon's words. Christopher tried to maintain a smile, but he was undoubtedly upset. The evening ended with an awkward atmosphere. After Christopher left, a sober Dylan sincerely apologized to us. Indeed, Dylan's opinion was nothing but a prejudice. Sharon's smile had proved Christopher was a good match, which was evident.
Gradually, seeing our daughter's happy smile, Dylan began to accept Christopher. They were supposed to have pledged eternal love at their wedding. They were supposed to be in love. Now, I regret not listening more to Dylan's concerns. As Sharon was approaching her thirties, she announced her pregnancy. Both Dylan and I were overjoyed. Dylan, like when he talks about tourist destinations, awaited the grandchild's birth with a childlike smile. And I too, got too excited for my age. You two are getting ahead of yourselves. Then, at Sharon's request, she and Christopher decided to move in with us. We thought it would be better for everyone to live here together. We were saying you guys would surely be happy living with your grandchild. That's true. You both have jobs, right? Leave the caregiving to grandma and grandpa. Don't worry. Their belongings had already been moved from the nearby apartment where they had been living. Everything was prepared for the whole family to live together. Tears welled up as I thought about my daughter's growth and the upcoming birth of my grandchild. As we had these conversations, Sharon's belly grew. Christopher was still busy with work. I understood his job, but I wondered if he couldn't be a bit more supportive of Sharon. As for Sharon, being on maternity leave, she spent most of her time at home. I asked about Christopher's work. Sharon, rubbing her belly, defended him. Christopher is busy. He's always on the go. But he calls every day to say good morning and good night. We're even thinking of names for the baby together. Hoping for a beautiful girl. Oh, we'd love to help pick a name too. Sharon smiled, savoring her happiness, as she listed a few name options. As the due date approached, Sharon decided to name the baby Tiana. The moment Tiana was born, her vibrant cry was indescribably precious. Sharon's relieved expression. Tears in Christopher's eyes. Dylan's beaming smile. And Tiana, trying her best to breathe. I was confident that our lives were solid and would continue to be so. However, the happy future I envisioned never came to be. At the height of my daughter's happiness, I was shocked to learn a disturbing truth from Dylan. He had confirmed some unbelievable behavior from Christopher. I didn't want to doubt him. He was supposed to be the perfect husband for my precious daughter. Despite my uneasy feelings, Dylan, with a serious expression, insisted. I saw it with my own eyes. I know it's hard to believe Christopher's suspicious behavior. Violet, you might not want to know, but it's true. That man is lying. To us and to Sharon. I had never seen Dylan so emotional in over 30 years together. From his unsettled state, I learned everything. Dylan's seriousness made me realize the gravity of the situation. But it was too much to accept all at once. Why would Christopher do such a thing? What about Sharon and Tionic? My heart pounded, wishing I hadn't heard this truth. I wanted it all to be a lie. Especially since Tiana had just been born. Since Dylan told me, a swelling rage grew inside me. I felt the greatest anger of my life. I didn't know what the right answer was, but it was for Sharon and for Tiana. Reluctantly, I decided to follow Dylan's plan. Then we quietly began our preparations, just the two of us. Meanwhile, Tiana continued to grow. A month after her birth, we decided to go out as a family. The attendees were me, Dylan, Sharon, Christopher, and Tiana, five in total. I heard Christopher had planned this outing which was a great surprise. He had arranged everything, including the meal. Dylan and I carefully prepared for the day. Upon arrival, Sharon lovingly watched Tiana. After taking a family photo with Tiana at the center, I wished for these peaceful days to continue. I glanced at Christopher. He wasn't looking at Sharon or Tiana. Although smiling, Christopher's attitude and tone seemed detached, as if preoccupied with something else. Then Christopher suddenly said with a sly smile, I want to take this opportunity and discuss this with you. I had a DNA test taken because I thought she didn't look like me. And it turns out she's not my daughter. Christopher said so pointing at my granddaughter Tiana, who was being held by Sharon. 
I made an eye contact with my husband Dylan while Christopher was unable to hide his smirk. Just as I thought. I was disappointed, but quickly anger overwhelmed me. The test results show that Tiana is not my child. His shout drew the attention of those around us. So you've been cheating on me behind my back? You bastard. Were you having an affair with one of the fathers who picks up their kids from daycare? I felt a deep sense of regret. I still wanted to believe in him. A woman like this can't be trusted at all. Divorce. I want a divorce. Sharon seemed unable to comprehend Christopher's sudden change. She just froze and couldn't move. Sensing something amiss, Tiana, held by Sharon, started crying. Tiana's cries echoed throughout the area. After a moment, Sharon, with a look of astonishment, confronted Christopher. What do you mean why would you say that all of a sudden I haven't cheated? Christopher answered with a smug look. You say you haven't cheated but can you provide any concrete evidence right now? I can't provide that, but I really haven't. Ah, so you're making excuses. I have irrefutable evidence here. Saying this, Christopher showed us the DNA test results and a divorce application. The test results indicated that there was no proof of a parent-child relationship between Christopher and Tiana. Half of the divorce application was already filled out. He had prepared all this. Sharon, faced with this evidence, couldn't say anything, her face on the verge of tears. Her lips were tightly pressed, enduring the pain, and my heart ached for her. Who could have imagined she would be treated this way? The results show that she's not my child. A cheating woman made a child with some other man, and the DNA proves it. Sign the divorce papers quickly. If you resist, I'll take you to court and demand compensation. Then Christopher, who had retracted his smile, spoke in a low voice. Hey, I've got a good lawyer. You can't escape, so be prepared. It's incredible how far he could take this act. This, this was the man he turned out to be. I felt a rage towards him like never before for neglecting my daughter. Glancing at Dylan, I saw he was angry too. Now was the only chance. I exchanged glances with Dylan and then took out a photo we had prepared in advance. This photo was our trump card. Holding it with trembling, angry hands, I presented it in front of Christopher. If you're going to do that, we have something to present as well. Right, Dylan? Yes, indeed. Dylan pulled several photos from his jacket pocket. They were photos of Christopher's infidelity, obtained by hiring a private investigator. Each photo was decisive evidence, but we had prepared multiple. It's necessary to confront him thoroughly with irrefutable evidence. How come these are here? What's this? In each of the several photos, Christopher was clearly visible. There were pictures of him walking arm in arm with an unknown woman, entering a hotel with a woman, and kissing a woman on the street, among others. Since the day Dylan confirmed Christopher's suspicious behavior, we had been investigating his actions with a detective. The skill of a professional detective is astounding. So, you were regularly meeting another woman, planning to switch from Sharon to her? Who's the one cheating, I wonder? Dylan also started yelling as well. You bastard. Trampling on Sharon's feelings. Christopher's smile had vanished, replaced by an unmistakable panic. How did you find out? No, wait. This is fake. You made these composite photos to slander me, you liar. Sharon's the one cheating. His voice was low at first, as if reassuring himself, then became accusatory, threatening us. But my anger was beyond control. Dylan, as if echoing my fury, shouted. You're the one who is lying. Are you saying all these photos are fake? Perhaps feeling overwhelmed by Dylan, or realizing his excuses were futile, Christopher suddenly became quiet. Dylan, although sometimes seen as unapproachable, hardly ever raises his voice. I realized for the first time how intimidating he could be when he was truly angry. Dylan took a breath and began talking in a quiet manner. My discomfort wasn't mistaken. You might not have noticed, 
but I heard everything from the bathroom. Those overly suspicious conversations. Things like I'll manage the separation smoothly or help me forge the DNA report. I didn't intend to listen, but such conversations are obviously strange. You've been deceiving and hurting our daughters all this time. Dylan had accidentally overheard Christopher's phone conversation while he was in the bathroom. Dylan had been close to the door without realizing Christopher was there. And then Dylan raised his voice again. We're going to do another DNA test. Science will prove it. The second test should yield the same results, right? You'll take responsibility for what you've said. Don't even think about running away. Christopher's legs wobbled, his nose running, reduced to a pitiable state. Tiana, tired from crying, had fallen asleep. Was he always such a pathetic man? I remembered his sharp, robust appearance when he first came to ask for our daughter's hand in marriage. That man was nowhere to be seen now. At that moment, something snapped inside me. Sharon must have felt the same. Her eyes brimming with tears, she looked at Christopher with a mix of disgust and pity. I rubbed Sharon's back. I wanted to believe in you, if only I could. I sighed heavily, but now that the truth was revealed, Christopher could only apologize. His pride gone, his apologies seemed too late. Then, as Christopher was profusely apologizing, Sharon approached him. With tears in her eyes, she lashed out at him angrily. Don't joke around. It's too late to apologize now. Get out of our sight. You're the worst. Christopher's apology was cut off by the sound of a sharp slap. It felt like a satisfying sound that dispelled the terrible atmosphere. After receiving a powerful slap from Sharon, Christopher collapsed to his knees. He tried to flee but seemed unable to move, his legs giving out. As you wish, we'll part ways. Goodbye forever. Christopher received the stares of everyone around. Urged by Sharon, Dylan and I left the scene. Sharon didn't look back, not even once. According to the detective's investigation, Christopher's affair partner was an ex-girlfriend. The reason they broke up was apparently because he was a part-timer with low income at the time. Back then, Christopher was juggling part-time night shifts at a grocery store and stocking shelves at a supermarket. Later, Christopher joined a TV crew, and during a street interview for a TV program, he happened to meet his ex-girlfriend again. It was a wide show hosted by a celebrity known for his sharp tongue. His ex-girlfriend seemed impressed with Christopher, who had made a place for himself in the entertainment business. By this time, Sharon was already pregnant. Both wanting to rekindle their relationship, the ex-girlfriend was quite cooperative with this plan. Such a hopeless situation, I thought. Now that I knew the whole truth, my anger was replaced more with disappointment. On the way home, none of us spoke a word. If even we, as parents, were deeply hurt, Sharon's emotional wounds must be immeasurable. In the heavy silence, Dylan broke the ice. Hey. You should just rest for now. I'll take care of all the tedious things like the compensation claim and other procedures with Violet. Sharon just nodded silently. I also spoke to Sharon. Your life is still ahead of you. For Tiana's sake, eat delicious food, get plenty of sleep, enjoy beautiful scenery, and just focus on resting. We'll always be here to support you. Sharon was still struggling to come to terms with her feelings. But with Tiana there, we had to move forward. Few months passed by but Sharon tended to stay at home. Given what had happened, it was understandable. Yet gradually, she regained her smile and declared. If I keep mourning, Tiana's going to get mad at me. Mom, Dad, I'm sorry for worrying you so much. I'm thinking of returning to work soon. As for the compensation, Christopher and his party ended up paying $15,000 each. It was a deserved retribution. And Christopher was dramatically dumped by his ex-girlfriend. She was furious about the large sum of money lost because of him. That's a fitting end for such a man. Dylan said with a face that couldn't hide his disgust. About half a year later, in a season of blue skies, 
Sharon successfully returned to work. Worried, I secretly visited her workplace. My concerns were unnecessary, as I saw Sharon lively and happily working, surrounded by children. I told this to Dylan and to that he proudly snorted. I told you there was no need to worry, though he had hesitated to come with me till the last minute. Hearing Dylan's words, I couldn't help but laugh, feeling our happy daily life returning. Despite everything, our family had regained peaceful days. Tiana was growing up healthy. Dylan, now past 60, was still actively working. Today, I'm preparing a meal for a family dinner. After setting the table, I said to everyone, Let's go on a family trip again. Anywhere, as long as we're together. Absolutely. Anywhere we go will be fun. At that moment, Tiana made a sound as if replying. Her incomprehensible babble was enough to bring a smile to Sharon's face. We all smiled in response. Dad and Mom, live long, okay? I want to show Tiana the wide world. Just like the old times, I hope we can travel together again. Of course, I plan to live long. Right, Dylan? Yes, indeed. Maybe it's time to cut back on the alcohol. Dylan went to put the beer he had prepared back in the fridge. I too, thought about starting walking myself to stay healthy. With these four people, I felt like we could do anything. I want to continue spending my days in this house, unchanged. Because I know there is certain happiness here. My name is Monica. Whenever I see a beautiful woman of my age, I think to myself, I've got to work on my skincare, or maybe lose some weight. But, before I know it, I'm saying I'll start tomorrow every day, and now I'm 42. Lately, even using a toner feels like a chore, so my skin is protected by a natural oil veil of my own making. Hey Siri! Tell me how to fix my lazy nature and become like and Hathaway by just sleeping. Today, I want to share a story from back when I was still all about self-improvement. Please listen. It happened about 15 years ago. I had been married to my husband Andy for two years, but we were still very much in honeymoon mode. That's because Andy had to go on a business trip alone just six months into our marriage. He was selected as a temporary replacement because the person originally meant to go fell ill. I wanted to scream, don't disrupt our newlywed life. But being a junior employee, he couldn't disobey his superiors. I wanted to go with him, but we had just married and still had our condo lease. Breaking the lease for a short assignment and then having to find a new place seemed too much. After discussing it, we decided. It would be more trouble to go together for such a short time. We can manage being apart. So, just six months into our marriage, we ended up living separately. Finally, after about half a year, Andy's solo trip ended, and we could live together again. Finally we can spend time together! I was filled with the desire to enjoy our newlywed life. But it didn't quite go as planned. Originally, when Andy had to go on his business trip, my mother-in-law, Violet, got angry. Choosing to separate so early in your marriage, does Monica's love for Andy even exist? She started visiting our house frequently to check up on us. Let me make it clear, our separation right after the wedding was a mutual decision. We talked on the phone every night and met every two weeks. Our love hadn't faded just because we were newlyweds living apart. But Violet believed that a wife should always follow her husband. She thought a wife's fulfillment came from being by her husband's side and taking meticulous care of him. She had a bit of an old-fashioned view. It seemed more like Violet wanted to do these things rather than being asked by her husband. To me, she looked like a self-satisfied, overbearing wife. Because of this, during Andy's business trip, Monica is probably cheating on Andy by not going with him. Violet had such misunderstandings. Andy tried hard to clear up these misunderstandings, so our relationship on the surface was fine. But Violet seemed to have grown to dislike me for letting her son go on his own. Given this background, Violet frequently came to our house for what she called daughter-in-law's work check. In short, it was to see if I was properly managing the household and treating Andy right. I wasn't doing anything wrong, so she could look all she wanted. 
If that would earn her trust, then so be it. First, she would come over unannounced and immediately start inspecting the bathroom and shower, looking for any dirt. A single hair or eyelash out of place meant I failed. She would yell at me if there was even a slight water stain on the shower mirror. How can it be spotless every day when it's used daily? I wanted to shout, I work too, you know? But I had to endure. Then the fridge was checked. If it didn't have Andy's favorite foods, she'd get mad. Once, fearing Violet's surprise checks, I kept donuts, Andy's favorite, in stock daily. Andy was happy eating them, but he ended up gaining weight, resembling a donut himself. That couldn't be good, if I did everything Violet said, Andy might end up with lifestyle diseases. Realizing the danger, I stopped keeping sweets in the house. Hang in there, Andy, until you lose some weight. But when Violet noticed the donuts were gone, she labeled me as cruel for not letting a tired Andy eat his favorite foods. I understood why Andy said he lost weight when he lived alone. Only I could extend Andy's life. Furthermore, if Violet found leftovers from last night's dinner in the fridge, she got angry. If you can't even manage portion sizes, that's just basic. But we're a newlywed couple and not that wealthy. Andy and I, both working, talked it over. Let's cook meals in bulk to save on household chores. And Andy finally suggested that. With his unpredictable working hours, Andy could hardly participate in housework. I believed it was fine for whoever could do it to handle it, so I didn't mind. I was more worried about Andy overexerting himself and getting sick. But Andy proposed this idea. I don't want all the burden to fall on Monica. He said so. We explained all this to Violet, and when Andy spoke, she stayed silent. But when it was just the two of us, she started saying all sorts of things as if her emotions were exploding. Andy told me I could ignore Violet's words, and even said I didn't have to let her into our house. But I couldn't do that. Whenever Violet came over, she was always waiting at the entrance when I returned from my part-time job. Additionally, she seemed to have become friendly with the neighbors her age, so when I saw them chatting and smiling. Look, she's back. Ah, uh, Monica, I was waiting for you. I just couldn't choose not to let Violet in. Moreover, Violet told the neighbors, I'm helping because my son's wife can't do any housework. So, from the outside world, our household looked like a kind mother-in-law and a clueless, incompetent daughter-in-law of the modern times. Violet seemed pleased with the situation. You're lucky to have a good mother-in-law like me to teach you things. Every time she pointed something out, she said that. Sorry, I don't think so at all. I'm a modern woman, I don't understand these things. I'd like to tell her that, but then I'd just be playing into Violet's hands. It would only add to the useless daughter-in-law stories she shared with the neighbors. But, my patience was reaching its limit. I know you're newlyweds and new at a lot of things, but you're going to have to learn all this stuff so you don't get in trouble with Violet. A neighbor said to me, and I felt last night's curry boiling up in my stomach. The neighbors didn't know what went on inside our house, and I hadn't corrected Violet's narrative, so it was understandable. The truth was it wasn't my fault, but Violet's rules were too overbearing. I was working and managing the housework, and more importantly, if Andy was satisfied, that should be enough. After all, this house was mine and Andy's house. But as a newlywed, I couldn't speak out. I would say it now, being stronger. But back then, I was young and wanted to maintain a good relationship with my mother-in-law. I thought enduring it was the right thing to do. I didn't openly refute Violet's words to the neighbors for the same reason. If I did it, I would have been labeled as a defiant young person. That was probably my mistake, Violet's behavior gradually escalated. She started staying for dinner and then overnight. This made it impossible for Andy and me to, well, never mind. Let's save that for a late-night adult channel talk. Haha. <laughs> well, for a newlywed couple, having her stay over was truly a nuisance. Even Andy complained that. Even though she's my family, I can't relax with my mom around, that's strange. He was subtly supporting me and trying to prevent friction between me and Violet, so he must be stressed too. 
I felt sorry for Andy, coming home tired. A few times, Andy said to Violet. Dad will get lonely, go home. But she said. It's okay, James told me to look after things. I'm representing him. She used the authority of Andy's father, James, to her advantage. Andy's family is an old-fashioned type that believed in the wives should obey their husband's principle. Even at this time of being married, Andy still had some irrefutable disagreements with James. The ingrained senses could be frightening, but for me, getting scolded by my dad always hurt more than by my mom. In short, my father was like the last line of defense. My mother got angry sometimes, but angering my father felt like the end of the world. He was like a mental pillar. That was why I thought I understand Andy's feelings. And since Violet started eating dinner at our house, I had been messing up dinner more often. The breakfasts I made when Violet wasn't around had never failed since we got married. At first, I thought I had messed up, and I think Andy did too. I apologized to Andy. Sorry, looks like I messed up. But Andy replied. It's rare for you. Aren't you tired? Take a rest today. But only Violet exaggeratedly complained. Wow, this is so salty, it'll shoot up my blood pressure. I thought it was salty too and the taste could raise blood pressure, so I honestly apologized. But soon I started to wonder, was I failing so often? Even when the taste seemed fine during cooking, it would be too sweet or too salty at dinner. I even got checked at the hospital, but there was nothing wrong with me. Could it be? I thought, and on a whim, I made dinner on the day Violet visited and left the kitchen. And that happened just as I suspected. Violet was humming and heavily sprinkling salt into the pot. The strength in her right hand and shoulder, holding the salt, was like she was avenging her parents. She could have surpassed a professional baseball player with that. Humming nonchalantly, she was ruining my cooking. I thought I had to tell Andy. But that night, Andy was extremely tired. He had been doing overtime every day for over three weeks, and the project deadline was looming. Plus, our wedding anniversary was the following week, and he was trying to get time off for it. We spent our first anniversary apart, so Andy had suggested a date for this year. Inside, my feeling was torn among wanting him to rest, looking forward to the date, and trying not to burden Andy. That was my recent state. I would talk to him about Violet after the anniversary. While I was thinking this, an incident happened. Of all nights, it was our wedding anniversary. True to his word, Andy took the day off and took me on a date. He wanted my homemade dinner, so when we got back home after the date, there she was. At the front door, that person was. It's your wedding anniversary today, right? I made dinner. Violet said, showing Tupperware from her bag. As I thought, uh oh. And looked at Andy, he looked the most resigned. But we couldn't be so cruel as to send away someone who brought food. Andy seemed to be resigned to it too. Eat and then go home today. He said that and opened the front door. I was so looking forward to coming home with Andy and having dinner. Now the entrance looked like the gates of hell. God, please protect us. Violet entered the living room, happily opened the Tupperware, and ordered me to get the dishes. Wanting her to leave quickly, I moved promptly and obediently. Andy seemed to feel the same and helped, but Violet said. You sit down. You're the star today. And she moved the chair at the table to make Andy sit. Wait, what day is this? Isn't the wedding anniversary about the couple? Why is an outsider taking charge? But I stayed quiet. Of course, it was to send her home quickly. We should work emotionlessly like a robot, eat dinner, and send Violet home. That was the mission for us as a couple. Let's do this. What Violet prepared was Andy's favorite meatloaf and sides. Seeing this, I again thought, oh. Noticing my face, Andy asked me. What's wrong? Well, I doubled up. You like meat dishes, so I was preparing a steak with premium meat. I honestly told that. Then Violet exclaimed. Oh, premium meat. Great. Cook it quickly. 
Of course, I hadn't prepared a portion for Violet, but she seemed eager to eat. However, saying no, wait. Would just extend the time with Violet in a lecture. I'd rather avoid that at all costs. I should have kept quiet. Despair filled my heart as I reluctantly began preparing the steak. Here you go, I said as I placed the cooked meat on the table. I had other side dishes in mind, but for today, this would be enough. So, I gave my steak to Violet and thought I'd just eat her brought meatloaf and sides. Thank you. This is special for you, Monica. I made it just for you, always working so hard. With a big smile, Violet pulled out a large Tupperware from her bag. Looking inside, at first glance, it seemed like a meatloaf drenched in gravy sauce, but on closer inspection, something was off. It was strangely red and shiny. Wait! Raw meat? What is this, so mysterious and unknown? Why mine was different from Andy's tomato sauce version? Let me remind you, Violet had a history of turning my cooking into a high blood pressure menu. Would such a person cook for a wedding anniversary? I peered at the offered meatloaf for a moment, managing to thank her while buying time. Upon closer inspection, this is. Andy also peeked into the Tupperware and then at my face. It was amazing how couples could communicate just with a glance. Andy, go ahead and eat. Yeah, yours looks like better meat, I'll take it. Thanks. What? Violet's eyes widened at our exchange. Andy didn't hesitate to transfer the meatloaf from the Tupperware to his plate. You don't have to do anything. Normally, Violet would say like that, but now, she was just pale and silent as I thought. Well, everything's ready, let's eat. No, no! Violet snatched the meatloaf from Andy's hand with a near scream. The moment it fell and hit the floor, there was a thud, an unusual sound for a meatloaf. This meatloaf makes quite a noise, doesn't it? Indeed. Did you overcook it, Violet? I asked with a sarcastic smile, while Andy just stared at Violet. She remained silent, eyes downcast at the meatloaf. Hey, Violet. Why is it okay for me to eat it, but not Andy? Come on, tell me. Hey, hey. I annoyingly hovered around the stunned Violet. My patience, already thin from her ruining our anniversary, had reached its limit. The thrill of retaliation was unexpectedly exhilarating. Uh, Andy doesn't like tomato sauce. I wanted to make something he likes for the anniversary. Eh? I like any meat, really. It's a waste, maybe it's still good, I'll eat this. No, you shouldn't eat something that's fallen. Violet panicked as Andy casually picked up the meatloaf, talking nonchalantly. Is it wrong for me to eat what I like? Right. It's a shame not to eat it though he says he will eat it. Oh, Violet, you can eat it, it's okay. A little bit won't hurt. Andy's smirk was barely containable, understanding everything from the sound meatloaf was dropped. I almost laughed but managed to restrain myself. Maybe it's too big for you to eat? We have steaks. Should I cut it smaller, wait here? Eh? Oh, I'll cut it then. Right, do that. As Violet flustered, Andy brought the cutting board and knife. Here goes. Let's it cut, but as expected, the meatloaf couldn't be cut. Oh my, this meatloaf is quite hard, isn't it? Maybe the gravy sauce is slimy? Maybe it'll work if it's washed. Great idea. This was a turning point for Violet, but I headed to the sink with the meatloaf. Wait. Stop. Please, Monica. I'll remake it. Remake it? How was she planning to do that? Could she really think we hadn't noticed? Both Andy and I had realized it from the moment it was in the Tupperware. Ignoring Violet's attempt to stop us, washing off the gravy sauce revealed a food sample meatloaf. This is clearly not meat, even without tasting it. Violet, do you make meatloaf out of wax? A family recipe? A secret ingredient? It's a bit too conspicuous, though. I waved the food sample meatloaf next to my face, taunting Violet. So I grew up on wax, huh? You're a wax figure. Stop it, that's creepy. Kidding. I know. 
Violet glared at us with a hateful look as we joked around. Violet, I understand you dislike me, but aren't you embarrassed by such an obviously childish setup? Shut up! It's your fault for not divorcing despite my coming over every day! So, I had no idea that she was hoping for a divorce. After all, both Andy and I, though annoyed by Violet, still loved each other. We never even considered divorce, so we didn't raid into Violet's intentions. We only thought about how to get her to leave quickly or how she was a nuisance. Now that I think about it, Violet's method to push for a divorce was incredibly inefficient. You could have just said so. I should have been clear too, like, Violet, you're annoying, stop adding salt to my cooking. Eh? Both Violet and Andy were surprised by this. The dinners were oddly sweet or salty, so I spied on Violet after cooking. And there she was, shaking salt like she was vanquishing something. Do you want to shorten your life that much? Violet turned bright red. She seemingly didn't expect that I had noticed. Sing that song again, please. You were humming, right? It was good. Violet glared at me with teary eyes as I egged her on. Humming or talking to oneself is most embarrassing when you know someone heard. Humming while ruining Monica's cooking. Andy glared at Violet. I can't believe it. I said, and then. Why would you go that far? Andy held his head. Mom, even if you do such things, I won't divorce. What's the point? You want me to suffer through a divorce I don't want? Violet looked at him in surprise by a pure question from Andy. No. It's undeniable, right? It's only because Monica is patient. Otherwise, I might have been divorced. It was a fair point. In that sense, I should be known as the patient daughter-in-law who endures Violet's unreasonable demands in the neighborhood. Enough. It's an important day, so please leave. Here, take your wax meatloaf as a souvenir. Wait, Andy. I... Violet clutched Andy's arm, trying to persuade him. Ah, uh, enough! I was really looking forward to today. I finally got a day off. I don't even have the energy to be angry anymore. You've been a nuisance every day, and now you ruined the day I worked so hard for. It's too much. Get out! Andy skillfully twisted his hand free from Violet's grip and pushed her out the front door. Violet wailed outside, but I no longer feared the neighbor's opinions. There was no turning back now. Andy seemed to feel the same, declaring a redo of our anniversary. He eagerly asked for my cooking. I laughed and replied. Sure. Violet's crying didn't bother us. Afterwards, due to complaints from the neighbors about the noise, Andy contacted James, who came to pick up Violet. Surprisingly, upon seeing Violet, James slapped her cheek. I heard that James had always reprimanded Violet, saying she shouldn't visit us too often, that a couple needs their own time to be truly a couple. But she didn't listen, insisting we were happy with her visits. James kept quiet, thinking we were enjoying it, unaware of the trouble we were experiencing. After apologizing to us, James also explained the situation to the neighbors on our behalf. Thanks to that, word spread through the condo, and I was able to shed the reputation of being the clueless and incompetent daughter-in-law. I was grateful for James' intervention, my own words wouldn't have had the same effect. Thank you, James. And now. After being scolded by James, Violet stopped imposing on our home. But she harassed me whenever we went back home, thinking nobody was watching. However, James, suspecting something like this, caught her red-handed and averted any issues. Well, not for Violet. If you keep trying to make Andy and Monica divorce, you can't stay in this house. James said so and Violet was told to divorce. Thanks to that, we found peace, but I worried about elderly James living alone. So we decided to live with him. Initially, it was out of gratitude, but it turned out to be quite wonderful. He would pick up our son from kindergarten without being asked and he cooked French cuisine, drawing on his experience as a former restaurant staff. It's embarrassing how well he takes care of us when we should be the ones helping him. 
Once again, thank you, James. For him, living in a lively home with small children at his age was something he never expected, and he's grateful for it. He's too good of a person, truly a father to be respected. It makes sense why Andy couldn't argue with him, and why his words were absolute in his home. He's always right. No wonder he's absolutely truthful. Even at our home, we obediently listen to what he says. Honestly, it's not like winning the lottery or a grand business success, not the happily ever after you hear in fairy tales. But with not only James, but two sons and a daughter, our days are lively, just as James said they would be. Even as a wife who doesn't bother with skincare and is getting older, I have a kind, loving husband who still takes me on dates for our anniversary every year. Oh, I do my share of housework in parenting. Just tend to put myself last, hehe. <laughs> Despite everything, I've come to appreciate the ordinary. It's been 15 years since we were married. We still have the freshness of newlyweds, combined with the comfort and laxness that comes with familiarity, feeling happiness in everyday life. For our next anniversary date, I should work on skincare and getting in shape. I think I said that last year too. <laughs>